Okay, so this is the second half of the 4.4 lesson. And we see here that this theorem says mean value theorem for integrals. Now yesterday we did the fundamental theorem of calculus, which really was more like a formula for the, doing definite integrals. Okay, here we have another theorem with a name. We're gonna do a theorem write up on both of these tomorrow in class. Um, and so, um, you know, write down what you need to know that later on we're gonna, you're going to do a theorem right after and turn that in for daily grade. So let's just review really quick though. What was the mean value theorem like? What did we do before with mean value theorem? Do you all remember anything about it? What is another word for mean? Average. Average. So what do we do in calculus with average? The average rate of change. The average rate of change. So. Do you remember anything about where the average rate of change equaled? Yeah, it was the formula. And in general, it was just basically the average rate of change equaling the instantaneous rate of change. In other words, the estimation of a slope like over the course of two points, okay, it wasn't like the best answer for a rate of change. It was an average rate of change. That equaled, according to this theorem, the instantaneous rate of change, which was the slope of the tangent line, which was an exact answer that we found by taking derivative. All right. So what we're going to do, see with this theorem, is a similar concept of something that is a, kind of like an estimation equaling something that's more exact that we can calculate. Okay. So it says we have to have a function that's continuous. Okay, that was true for the other uh, mean value theorem. And we have to have a closed interval. That was true for the other mean value theorem as well. There exists a number C such that. Does that sound familiar? A little bit at all. Okay, that was part of the other one. So this C is this magic number. And it follows this formula. And we had a formula for the other mean value theorem. You may, like, you may or may not remember it. But it's okay if you don't remember it, if you remember the concept. Sometimes the concept helps you figure it out. So let's piece, like, kind of like tear apart this formula. So first of all, this piece right here, what does the integral from a to b of f of x represent, say, on this picture? And I'm going to go ahead and write, it's an integral. But what does it represent on the picture? It is the area underneath this curve and the x-axis. In other words, it's this area right here. Okay, That's what the integral means exactly. And we just yesterday figured out or learned how to find that. You do the antiderivative and then you plug in your bounds. Okay, So I'm going to put this under here. It's the area under the curve. And I, was, I really want to emphasize that this is an exact answer, okay? And we have to have calculus in order to do this. Okay, by mean value theorem for integrals, if these conditions are met, that exact area is equal to this other area, okay? But this is not an area under the curve. Let's look at this picture and see uh, what this is. So we have f of c and we have b minus a. We have something times something. All right, I am going to highlight now in blue what area we're talking about here. Okay, so what shape do we have? A rectangle. Do you remember doing any rectangles any time in the recent past? Area of rectangles. When did we do that? We did it when we did Riemann sums, correctly? This is correct, correctly. That doesn't even make sense. Whatever. Riemann sum. Okay, we did this before we did integrating because this was how we estimated the area under the curve. Well, it just so happens that there is a single rectangle that is a perfect fit. It's an exact answer and it's in the sweet spot. All right, so how do you find an area of a rectangle? Base times side. Base times side. So that's what these two things mean. Okay, let's look at it. First of all, the base of this rectangle, look at it, it goes from A to B. Let's say A was 2 and B was 12. What would be then the base of that rectangle? 10. You subtracted, maybe consciously, maybe not at all. So the base here is B minus A. 
that is how wide the base of this perfect rectangle is. And so above here, I'm going to put the base, the base of that rectangle. All right. So what must f of c equal? The height, the height of that rectangle, and it does. I'm just going to put ht. You write out the word height if you think that might confuse you later. So the c is somewhere in here. Okay, it looks like, according to this picture, that it's the midpoint, but it does not have to be exactly in the middle. It could be closer to A or closer to B, but there's some C somewhere in here, in between, such that if you follow the C all the way up, okay, to the curve, and if you think about it, if the X value is the C, what's the Y value on a curve of F of X? Okay, so f of x is the curve, and if the x value is c, the y value is just f of c. Does that make sense? Like if I said when x is 2, what's the y value? That you would evaluate f of 2 in the function, you plug 2 in. So when x is c, the y value is f of c, and that ends up being the height of this rectangle. Okay? I'm explaining all of this so that this formula isn't just one more thing to memorize. I want it to make sense. Mean value theorem for integral states that we have the area under the curve exactly, which is represented by the integral. That is equal to a one really special rectangle, okay, where the x value is c and the height is f of c and the base is b minus a. Okay, in other words, somewhere between the rectangles that overestimate and underestimate their area under the curve, there's a rectangle that is exactly equal, precisely equal to the area of the region under the curve. If these conditions are met, this is what the theorem says. So this is how a question you will be asked. This is like how this will be asked to you. So um, find the value of C guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals, and then they give you this function, and they give you an interval. Now, when they give you an interval, they're giving you the A and the B value. A would be the lower bound, B would be the upper bound. All right? And we're looking for C. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this formula up here, which is just setting two different area things equal to each other, area expression. And we're going to take what's in that problem, and we're going to find C by doing that. And so I have the integral. It's going to be from A to B, which in this case is 1 to 3 of f of x, so they give us f of x is 9 over x cubed. Now, if I know I'm going to take the antiderivative, what's a better way to write 9 over x cubed? Right, 9x to the negative 3. And you saw, hopefully you did this on the quiz we just took, when you saw something like that, you changed it this way. Okay, so that's the left-hand side. And I'm going to keep color coding this for a little bit just to kind of really drive this home. So f of c, all right? If f of x is 9 over x cubed, then f of c is 9 over c cubed. And I'm not going to integrate the right-hand side, so I don't need to rewrite it in any special way. I just write it as it is. Okay, times, parentheses, b minus a, the base of the rectangle, which in this case would be 3 minus 1. If you wanted to, you could go ahead and call that 2, like if it made sense to you. You don't have to show the 3 minus 1. You could just put 2 right there. All right, so what we need to do is figure out the left-hand side all the way, simplify by the right-hand side, solve out this formula. So this left-hand part in red is what we learned yesterday. So remember, you rewrite the 9, you leave a space, and then what would the new power on x become? Negative 2. You add 1 to that power. And then the reciprocal of negative 2 would be negative 1 half, and that goes in front here. And we don't need a plus C because this is a definite integral with bounds, and our bounds are 3 and 1. And we put them at the end with the bar like this to signify, hey, I took the antiderivative, but I still need to actually plug in the bounds. Okay? Let's go ahead and simplify the right-hand side. You could, if you wanted to, just go all the way down on the left and then figure out the right. You could work one side at a time, but I'm going to go ahead and do both, just on this example. So if 3 minus 1 is 2, we already said that, the whole right-hand side becomes 18 over c cubed. Now, 
There's not anything else I can do on the right hand side. So I really just need to figure out the left hand side. And that should be a number in the end. Okay, so remember what to do with the bounds next? You plug the bounds in and you start with the upper bound. So you plug three in. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and call this nine times negative a half, nine, negative nine halves. Okay, you don't have to. You could keep it separate if you wanted to. So I plugged in the upper bound and then I go minus parentheses. Now I'm going to plug in the lower bound. And again, I'm going to call this negative 9 halves. And when I plug in the 1, it goes 1 to negative 2. All right. And then the right-hand side, I'm going to stop the color coding just because there's nothing else I can do on that right-hand side. That equals to h over c cubed. Now, yesterday, we talked about how you really don't need to simplify this unless you're told. All right. But in this case, I do need to simplify it because I'm looking to solve for C. So I need to go ahead and actually find C. So what would 3 to the negative 2 become? So 3 squared would be 9. So 3 to the negative 2 would be 1 over 9. Remember, a negative exponent is when you flip it, reciprocal. And see how the 9s cancel? So this whole first term becomes negative 1 half. All right, looking at the second term, 1 to any power is 1. So don't spend any more time than you need to on that one. So that becomes plus 9 halves. And remember, this whole thing equals 18 over c cubed. So negative 1 half plus 9 halves. I'm going to move all this up here. That becomes what? This left-hand side. Was that simplified here? Right, negative one half plus nine halves is eight halves, which is four. You do whatever number crunching you need to do to figure out that that's four. This is where I'm really going to encourage you when you're practicing this not to use your calculator so you don't, those like number crunching skills don't go away. All right, now from here, I need to get C by itself. So I'm going to cross multiply. So this is just a bunch of algebra at this point. Doesn't mean that's easy for everybody, but it is algebra. Okay, divide by four. And then C would be the cubed root of 18 fourths. Could we simplify 18 fourths? Sure, we could. We don't have to, though. All right, and that's how you find C. Now, remember, C was that special x value that told you where the um, where that rectangle was on the curve. All right, now let's say as an afterthought, I said, okay, great, you did all that, perfect, you did exactly what you were asked to do. Now I want you to find f of c. We don't need to start over from the beginning. Let's take what we found, let's take our function, and let's find f of c efficiently. So what do I need to do with the c value? Yeah, plug it into the original equation. f of x equals 9 over x cubed. So f of c is going to be 9 over this thing cubed. OK? All right, and this is, this is great. You don't have to simplify. I will tell you, if you did simplify, the cubed and the cubed root would go away, and you'd have to divide that fraction, and it would equal 2. All right, can you remind me, what on the picture does f of c represent? The y value, or what about with the rectangle? The height of the rectangle. Okay, so in this problem, we know that the height of the rectangle is 2. Now, actually, that thing that I kind of had you do as a second part um, has a special name. The value of f of c in these is called the average value. You need to know that. When I, if I were to say find the average value, you need to know that that really means find f of c. Okay, and you also need to know that that means the height of the rectangle. 
Okay, now we just saw one way to find f of c. You could do use that um, formula basically to find c and then plug it back into the original equation. That would find f of c. There's actually a little bit more straightforward way of finding, like let's say I didn't care about what c was, I just wanted f of c. There's a little bit more straightforward way. So I'm going to kind of explain this a couple of different ways. Um, do you remember me ever asking you to do average something when we did Riemann sums? So with Riemann sums, a lot of times I gave you a table, and let's say the table was velocity. I said, how many miles, blah, 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 and you just did the Riemann sum and everything was great. But do you remember when I asked you, okay, well, what's the average velocity? What did you have to do to the Riemann sum at the very end? Divide by the total amount of time. Okay, that's exactly what this is. It's not in a context of time, really, but that's what average value is. Okay, so I want you to look at this next part, and I don't want you to think this is totally different, because I'm going to connect this with what we did earlier in a minute. But look at what f of c, the average value, which is what f of c is, it is the integral. So we're not doing a Riemann sum, we're doing an actual integral, so it's better than a Riemann sum, in other words. And what we're going to divide by is the total amount of time, but it's not time anymore. It's just um, the base of the rectangle or the interval. And so if I kind of go back up to this picture, okay, B minus A would tell you, okay, this is before this was a time graph, all right, but it's the same idea. It's the span of the interval. That's what you're dividing by. So instead of doing a Riemann sum, dividing by the total time, you're doing an actual integral and you're dividing by the difference in the um, interval, okay? Now, before we do this other problem, I want you to look here and I want you to look at the first formula and it's really hard for me to show these on my screen at the same time, so you're going to have to look at your paper. But I want you to look at the first formula and I want you to look at the second formula and tell me algebraically how do we go from the first formula to the second formula? How do they isolate f of c? You might, you're going to want to look at your paper because, again, they're not showing on the screen at the same time because they're too far apart in the paper. So from the top formula to this formula, how did f of c get by itself? What happened to the equation algebraically? Anybody? Yeah. You divided by B minus A. That's it. Okay, so let me just scroll up one more time. So this thing right here, if you divided that to the other side, you would be left, F of C would be by itself. That's what this is. It's not a totally different formula. It's the same idea. Okay, I don't want this to be something you just memorize as some random formula because you're going to mess it up. You're not going to remember it. But I want you to try to let it make sense as much as possible. It's going to take, like, thinking about it and practicing it. Okay, so enough of that said, let's just practice this concept. Okay, so um, find the average value. So, again, you need to know that average value means find F of C. We could do it the way we did the top problem, okay, if we wanted to. But I told you, it's actually a little bit better more straightforward doing it this way. Okay, you, get, you end up doing a little bit less work. So 1 over B minus A. So here we have our interval, 1 and 4. So what B minus A, that would be 4 minus 1, which is going to turn into a third. Then we're going to integrate my bounds of integration right there in the interval, 1 to 4. The F of X given right here. So the f of x and interval are always going to be given. Okay. So this is going to be equal to a third. And I'm going to put a big bracket, so I'm going to have something next. So I'm going to go through this part really fast. So hang on. This, that's because this is review. Antiderivative of 3x squared, x cubed. Antiderivative of 2x, x squared. We took the antiderivative, so now I'm ready to plug in 1 and 4. Okay, next would be plugging in the numbers. So we start by plugging in 4. 
4 cubed minus 4 squared minus, now we plug in a 1. I told you I was going to go fast on this. But that's because we've already done this part. Okay, you do the antiderivative, you plug in your bounds, that's it. And unless otherwise told, you don't have to simplify. That's your answer. Do you feel confident that you could simplify this given some time? Yes. I like that, confident, yes. All right, you'd end up getting 16. We just don't have the time to go through that part right now, okay? All right, so how high, what's the height of the rectangle in this problem? 16. That's what the average value is. It's the height of that rectangle. All right, now, it does say on the second part of this, and find all values of x. This is basically saying find c. So we could go through and start this whole problem over, but I don't want to do that. We already did all this work to find f of c. So it's kind of like the last problem. If you already know f of c, and you know f of x, what would be the easy way to just find c? What are we going to do with 16? What? Plug it in for x or for f of x? f of x. And we don't want to plug it in for x because, honestly, that wouldn't make sense. And it said find the values of x. c is a value of x. Now, we're not going to solve this right now. But how would you solve this? You'd have to fact you'd have to subtract the 16 factor or quadratic formula or something like that. Okay. Now, I know it seems like we should be done. We don't have that much time left, but I'm gonna teach you one more thing. But I promise you this is the easiest thing that we are gonna learn in this whole chapter. Okay, are you ready? Now I'm gonna go through it pretty fast, but all day today people are freaked out and then they're like, oh that was super easy. Okay, the second fundamental theorem of calculus is for when you want to derive an integral. Now these are equal and opposite actions, okay? They cancel each other out. The only thing you have to be concerned about is your bounds. You have to deal with your bounds if they're there, okay? So look at this first problem. I'm just gonna do the example. So we're given a capital F of X and the directions say find the derivative. So look at this, capital F prime of X. When you derive an integral, you may be thinking, why would I do this? Well, you'd be asked to do it, but here we go. I want you to circle what's the function. You're not gonna do anything to that function except plug your bounds in, okay? We're not integrating, we're not deriving. You could do both and get the same answer I'm gonna get, but you're gonna do a lot more work. So in place of t, you're going to just go ahead and plug in your upper bound. So that would be 2x, parenthesis, 2x squared plus 1. So I plugged in the upper bound 2x in place of t. So don't fade out on me here. You do have to remember this one tiny little thing, but it's super easy. You ready? you got to go times the derivative of the upper bound. So what's the derivative of the upper bound 2x? What's the derivative of 2x? 2. That's it. That's, well, that's the first part. Okay. Minus. Parenthesis. Now we got to plug in the lower bound. Okay. So the lower bound is x. So you're just plugging it in. You're not deriving or integrating. You're just plugging it in, replacing t, which was there, with your bound, which is x times the derivative of that bound. It's kind of like an application of chain rule, not exactly, but close. So what's the derivative of just x? One. That's it. That's your answer. If necessary, could you multiply that out and simplify it? If there's multiple choice, you could. Okay, but you don't have to. So let's do one more example, and then we're going to be done for the day, and we'll do these other ones tomorrow as practice, okay? So problem two, we're finding capital F prime of X. The way we need to do this is, again, I want you to circle what your function is. It just kind of highlights it, sets it apart. You don't integrate cosine, you don't derive cosine. You just plug in the upper bound. So that would be cosine of X cubed. And you multiply by the derivative of that upper bound. So what's the derivative of X cubed? Three okay. X squared, perfect. Okay, minus, parenthesis. 
Sometimes you don't need parentheses and sometimes you do. This is why I always just put up here. All right, now we plug in our lower bound, pi over 2. So I'm going to write, instead of cosine t, I'm going to write cosine of pi over 2 times, what's the derivative of pi over 2? Zero. Why zero? Because it's a number. And the derivative of any number is zero. So this whole second part ends up being zero. That's because the lower bound was a number. Now, next time when you recognize that, you can just write minus zero or nothing at the end if you wanted to. Okay, You're, you could always simplify if you wanted to. It's not wrong to simplify, you just don't have to do it unless it says or unless it's multiple choice. Okay?